Hello everyone, and welcome to Conway's Game of Life. This is one of the most fun labs, but it's also one of the most time-consuming, so be prepared to spend a lot of time in the lab on this before you pass off. There's a lot of information available on the course website about how the game is supposed to work. Basically, you have a large grid with a bunch of live and dead cells in it, and each generation is calculated based on the number of neighbors each cell has that are alive. So the rules for that are right here. Live cells will die unless they have exactly two or three neighbors and dead cells can come to life if they have exactly three neighbors. Now our implementation of this has two major parts to it. First, there's the algorithm that's going to do the calculations and create a successive generation. Then there's the part where we can load different images on the screen using run length encoding. And that creates the initial state that our calculation algorithm will then just run off until we tell it to stop. I'm going to start with the main loop that calculates the generations. So I'm going to start with some pseudocode. This is going to be our main loop. It'll be running most of the time. Now the way our grid is set up is a little difficult because we don't actually have enough memory for two 80 by 80 grids. In fact, we don't even have enough memory for one 80 by 80 grid. Instead, we have a 10 by 80 grid of uint 8s. Now uint 8 is a data structure that Dr. Roper has invented, and it's basically allowing us to create a bit array. If we created a normal 80 by 80 array, it would allocate far more memory for each cell of that array than we actually need, because we are only storing a 0 for a dead cell, or a 1 for a live cell. This uint8 array is taking the memory that it allocates for each cell, and it's using each bit in each cell to represent a different cell of the life grid. It makes accessing the data a little more complicated, but it works just fine. Let's get started. Now the easiest way to implement our generation calculator would be to have two arrays, one for the previous generation and one for the next generation. However, again, we don't have enough memory for that. So what we've done instead is we have one large life array and then three smaller arrays, life PR, life CR, and life NR. The three smaller arrays are always going to hold old data, data just from the previous generation. However, the big life array is going to hold a mixture of new and old information, and I'll explain how that works. So what these three small arrays do is they start on the first three rows of the big life array, and they have the same information as the first three rows of the big life array. What you'll do is you'll go across life CR and find if each cell should be alive or dead. But instead of changing those values in life CR, you're going to change it in the big life array. When you get to the end of life CR, the first row of your next generation has been calculated. So the life array now has a mixture of new and old data, but the three small arrays only have old data. So now we're finished with this row, and we need to change around the values that are in our small arrays. The focus is no longer on the row in life CR. We need to change the row that's represented by life NR. And we also have to remember that these rows must always hold old information. So instead of copying the next three rows from the big life array into those three, we're going to copy what's in current row into the previous row, and what's in the next row into the current row and then the next row of the big life array, which is still old data, into the next row. So those three arrays now represent the next line of the big life array and its neighbors in the previous generation. So what we need to do next is figure out how to copy information from the big life array into the smaller arrays and between the smaller arrays. So for this, we're going to need to use the instruction memcopy. If you merely set the arrays equal to each other, remember, an array is just a pointer to the first element of that array. So setting them equal to each other won't work. We need to actually copy what is in the memory locations to each other, and this is the fastest way to do it. This site explains it in the most clear and concise way. So let's go back to our systematic decomposition and start outlining how this is going to work. We know this is going to run pretty much forever unless we tell it to stop, so let's start by creating an infinite loop. Then we know we're going to need to parse through every cell of the big life array, so let's create a nested loop structure that will do that for us. So now I have my nested loop structure, and I want to start outlining how our calculations are going to work with this. So this while one is our outermost loop. Code inside this loop will only run once per generation. We'll only want to initialize the three small life arrays once per generation, so let's start with that. We'll copy the information of the first three rows of the big life array into the smaller three arrays. Now our innermost tier is going to deal with every cell, every generation. So this is where we'll want to calculate if a cell will be alive or dead. We'll check the number of neighbors in each cell. And then according to our life rules, we'll determine if a cell should live or die. 
Then, of course, we have to make it actually happen in the big life array. Our second tier will happen once to each row in every generation. So this is where we'll want to copy the information around in our small life arrays. Then right at the end of each generation, we'll want to output the information at the bottom of the screen. So code-wise, the trickiest part of all of this is interacting with the arrays because we have these UN8 bit arrays that are more memory efficient. However, Dr. Roper has kindly given us a head start on interacting with these data types. Go into the lab specs and dig around a little, you can find these lines of code here that will help you get to the right bit inside each UN8. So everything we need for cell birth and cell death are in here, and those are going to interact with the big life array. However, test cell is reading from old data, so instead of taking in row and column, it's going to take in an entire array life row. So that'll be life PR, life CR, life NR, and then the column. Now, cell birth and cell death here only change the value inside the array. It does not write the result to the screen. For that, you'll need to look at the lines given to you in part 3 for birth and death. The one under birth will draw to the LCD screen, and the one under death will erase that point on the LCD screen. You'll need both in the end to make it work. And I'll give you a hint, if you can figure out how to do that with a macro instead of a function, it'll run faster. So lastly, I want to just talk a little bit about the optimization requirement and how to test this if you haven't gotten your draw RLE pattern function working yet. So for optimization, the basic idea is you want to do as little as possible instruction-wise to make this algorithm work. The fewer instructions you have, the fewer cycles it will take, and the faster your program will run, which means you will get more generations per second. The best way to optimize is to cut any unnecessary operations out of your code. I can't really tell you how to do this because this is where the creativity comes into the project, but if you're finding that you're nowhere near five generations per second, the TAs can give you some hints on how to shave your time down a little. Lastly, for testing this, if you haven't gotten your draw RLE pattern working yet, you may want to just hard code in one of the patterns to work with so that you know how it's supposed to behave and if it's behaving wrong then obviously something is off with your algorithm. So that's the end of part one of this lab. I wish you all the best of luck and have fun optimizing.